you for the warm welcome uh, to myself. Uh, I must say, as I was sitting there, I felt quite comfortable, which sometimes is not easy when you're put in a, a situation like this. It's a humbling experience to have the opportunity to stand here and, and share what you believe to be uh, your faith. It's good to see you, um, Brother Snow and, and Sister here from Dargaville as well. I'm a member of the Dargaville Church, so we haven't travelled that far to come and visit Whangarei. And so before we start, I just want also to have a short word of prayer. I just feel at this moment um, I need it. So if we can just bow our heads for a short moment. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord, the shortcomings that I have, Lord, uh, I ask, Lord, that you may um, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Jesus must be revealed. Otherwise, we're all on the wrong path. And so may the Holy Spirit be uh, leading each one of us here this morning. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, <clears throat> could we say that if you were to study God's word, to understand scripture, and not understand how to put these teachings into practice wouldn't have much meaning in your life. It wouldn't have much meaning in your life really according to the way we understand God sees us. We don't have to be defeated day after day. The Bible does assure us that we can have the victory in Jesus Christ. We can live a victorious Christian life. And this is the theme of our study today, around how to live a victorious Christian life. And so, freedom. To be free. We understand that all right in the country that we live in, but... Could you imagine living in a place like Iraq and many other countries around the world? But freedom. Throughout the history of mankind, when people have not been free, man has been willing to do almost anything to get his freedom. Even to the extent of it costing him life itself. Man places freedom high on his priority list of life. He'll do most all, almost anything to be free. Now Jesus had this to say about freedom. And so turn to the Gospel of John chapter 8. Some of you may already know what I'm about to quote here. 8 verse 32, the Gospel of John, and it says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Freedom is not always involved with where you are at the time. You could be imprisoned, Yet you could be free. You might not be prisoned. You might uh, be seemingly free. Yet you're not free. You're in bondage. Now Jesus tried to get this idea across to the Jewish people of his time. He tried to get this idea across to the Jewish people of his time. What was involved in being free? Not being in bondage. But all they could ever think of was being in bondage to another nation. They didn't understand there was such a thing as spiritual bondage. And the Bible talks about being in bondage not just physically... 
but also spiritually. And so let us turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And let us read verse 3. And it says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so we know that through the history, individuals have been born into slavery. And it is the case with each one of us that we are born into spiritual bondage. And why do I make such a statement? We are children of wrath, the Bible says. That we are born, that's the way we're born into this world, with fallen natures, sinful natures. We're children of wrath. We are in bondage spiritually. Now, there have been individuals who have been forced into bondage. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, taken captive by King Nebuchadnezzar, forced into bondage. What does the Bible say about being forced spiritually into bondage? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, and let us read verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And some people are unclear on this point. God very rarely uses force. And there are people out there that who are just waiting for God to grab them by the scruff of the neck, give them a good shake, and then they will start to obey. The Lord does not work in this manner. It is the devil's way of working, using force, putting pressure on you any way he can. God does not use force. The devil uses force. Now the Bible says that there have been people who have been sold into slavery. We can recall a story of Joseph, where his brothers sold him to the Ishmaelites, and he was taken down to Egypt, sold into slavery. The Bible says we can be sold into slavery, into bondage, spiritually. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50, and let us read verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Where is the bill of your mother's divorcement, whom I have put away, or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities... Have ye sold yourselves, and for your transgressions is your mother put away? By our iniquities, our sins, we have sold ourselves into slavery. Jesus was trying to get these principles across to the people, and Jesus told them that they were in spiritual bondage. And their reply was this, found in John chapter 8 and verse 33. It says, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? They told Jesus they were children of Abraham. We're not in bondage to, to anyone. What do you mean? 
we will be made free. The next verse Jesus says, verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. You and I are a servant, a slave to sin if we don't understand the freedom there is in Jesus Christ. Now there's a lot of ways people have gotten out of slavery over the years. Some people have been able to buy their way out of slavery. They've saved money or family members or friends have helped them buy their way out of slavery or to buy their freedom. Is it possible to buy your freedom spiritually? If you're going to buy your freedom spiritually, the owner has to be willing to sell, and the devil is not going to sell. And so we're not going to buy our freedom spiritually. Now what about force? There have been people that have been big enough have been strong enough to force their way out of slavery. People physically have forced their way out of slavery. Do you think we can get out of spiritual bondage by force? The answer is no. None of us are stronger than the devil. And so you are not going to force your way out of spiritual bondage. Now, some people have got out of slavery simply by running away. They run off and they've said, well, I'm not going to be a slave anymore. And I don't think we could call that freedom when you're looking over your shoulder all the time as to who's chasing you. Nevertheless, spiritually, you can't run away from the devil. There's no way on the face of this earth that you can hide from the devil. There have been a lot of people who have got out of slavery simply by being released, simply by being set free. Physically they were released. Spiritually, you won't get out that way because the devil is not going to release anybody. And so the question is, if you can't buy your way to, out of slavery, you can't force your way out, you cannot spiritually run away, and the devil's not going to release us, how are we going to get out of spiritual bondage? If none of these things work, how are we going to get out of spiritual bondage? What does the Bible have to say? Let's turn to Romans chapter 7. Let's read 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. The law holds us in bondage because we are guilty. Because we have sinned, the law which is holy, just and good holds us in bondage. Well, how are we going to get out of this bondage? Romans chapter 7, and let us read verse 6. But, but, but now we are delivered from the law. That's a relief. But now we are delivered from the law. That being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so if you were a slave all your life, when you die, do you continue to be a slave? If you're a slave all your life, 
When you die, do you continue to be a slave? The answer is no. So the only way to get out of spiritual bondage or slavery is by dying. It is impossible to get out any other way. The law is going to hold you till you die spiritually. And this is what Paul was talking about from Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We must be willing to crucify the old man of sin. And until we crucify the old man of sin, we are not free. There's too many Christians in this world think they accept Jesus Christ and continue living the riotous life. We need victory over every sin that you and I secretly hang on to. Or you will miss out on eternal life. That is the way we get free. There are Christians who go around their whole life. They are in spiritual bond, bondage because they have never died spiritually, of course. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. And let us read verse, verse 3. And it says here, For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye, ha and ye shall be redeemed without money. You can't buy your way out, but as we have seen, you can die. Let's go back, return back to Romans. Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read Romans 6 verse 6. And it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. The old man is the old man of sin, the carnal nature, the one that goes contrary to God. We must take the old man of sin and crucify him. That brings freedom. And verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. So long as we take that old man of sin and we feed him, if we nurture him, will be a slave all our lives. But when the old man is crucified, of course the key there too is with Christ, you have been set free. You cannot live a victorious Christian life until you crucify the old man of sin. We must understand the wretched things that are in our life. They have to be put to the cross. We cannot live uh, thinking that we're going to have eternal life hanging on to sin. Amen. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And let us read verses 14 and 15. And it says... For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. <coughs> 
subject to bondage. Jesus said he'll set you free. But you have to be willing to die. That old man of sin needs to be put to the cross. This is necessary. And now we briefly need to talk about two laws that very few people understand. They make a big difference in our lives. Two laws. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8 and read them. Romans chapter 8. And let us read verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There's two laws there. <coughs> The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. Well, here's some basic things about the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death. It is stronger than you and I. Hebrews 2.15 says, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime Subject to bondage. The law of sin and death you cannot overcome by willpower. We have no power within ourselves to have the victory over this law. The law of sin and death. Well secondly, when we're born into this world, the law of sin and death starts operating in our, in our lives. You can't switch it on and off as you please. There's a lot of people who go through life wondering why they are doing the things that they do. Because this law is operating in their life. The law of sin and death. It is working against them. That law works against you and I. And that's what Paul was meaning when he said, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now what about this other law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? This law is stronger than the law of sin and death. We should say amen, brothers and sisters, for the law... Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath set me free. Amen. Amen. From the law of sin and death. We need to understand that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is stronger than the law of sin and death. The trouble is, we are not born with this law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. <coughs> when we're born, the law operating in our lives is the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is given at conversion. And when you give your heart to the Lord, then the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus starts operating in your life. This law is stronger than the other law. Romans chapter 7 and verse 6 says, But now we are delivered from the law. We have been delivered from the law of sin, of sin and death. <coughs> See? But now we are delivered from the law. So we've been delivered from the law of sin and and death. It continues that being dead wherein we were held. So we've taken the old man of sin and we've crucified him. We've come to the Lord and the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus starts working in us. Then it continues and says that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. 
And this is how we live a victorious Christian life. The first thing we must do is, what would you say? The, the first thing we must do, go to Jesus. You must go to Jesus. This is the first thing we must always do. Jesus calls us. We must go to Jesus. The next thing is to take that old man of sin and crucify him. If you don't crucify that old man of sin, you will never get the victory. And we know what we're saying. It's those who want to hold on to some of the sinful habits in our lives. It will not work. We need, this is character reformation right here and now. While we're living this life. God is wanting to rid every wretchedness out of your life. And now when we crucify the old man of sin, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus begins to work in your lives. And when it starts working, we are set free. Amen. Amen. Romans 6 verse 18 says, being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. Set free. I just want to read through Romans 6, 6 to 8. And it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. So, okay then. We take the old man, we crucify him with Jesus Christ. And we continue, and it says that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Amen. And so when we die with Christ, we're going to live with him also. When you crucify the old men of sin, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus comes into your life. Do you know what's going to happen? The Bible says you will produce fruit. There's a lot of Christians in this world who have never crucified the old man of sin and they wonder why their lives are so ineffective and why they do not produce any fruit in their life producing fruit comes natural you don't work at it when the law of spirit of life in christ jesus is in your life you will produce fruit i want to read romans chapter 7 and verse 4 romans 7 and verse 4 Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another. So I was married to the law of sin and death, but I crucified the old man of sin that I might be married to another. The other is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It continues and says, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 22 says, But now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye, should, uh, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. And as we come to Jesus, crucify the old man of sin, he sets us free. Let us turn now to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And let us read verses 8 and 9. For ye were sometimes darkness... But now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. And as we come to Jesus and we 
crucify the old man of sin, the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus begins to work in our lives and we will begin to produce fruit. It will be a natural process. And I want to ask you this question, is there any such thing as producing more fruit? Someone may say, well, I'd really like to produce more fruit. How do I produce more fruit? The question is, how do I produce more fruit? The Bible says this, Titus 3 verse 5, Not by works of righteousness which we have done. So it is a part of the trap of the devil, of his trap, he set for all of us, that we seem to try harder in life to do what is right, to produce more fruit. We tend to try and do that in life. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to the mercies he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. This verse is telling us how to produce more fruit simply by having more of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 7 and verse 38 reads, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And so what does that mean, out of his belly, out of, out of the believer shall flow rivers of living water? Out of the belly of the believer shall flow rivers of living water. What does that mean? Well, verse 39, that's uh, John 7, verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Scripture says that out of you will flow rivers of living water. This refers to the Holy Spirit. And if you want to produce more fruit, you will need more of the Holy Spirit in your life. And how do you have more of the Holy Spirit? If you can produce more fruit by having more of the Holy Spirit, then how do we have more of the Holy Spirit? How do we have more of the Holy Spirit in us? Let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. How do we have more of the Holy Spirit? Galatians chapter 3 and verse 14 says, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. If you want to have more of the Holy Spirit, you get it through faith. That is the way you receive more of the Holy Spirit, through faith. We find that the Scripture ties faith and the Holy Spirit together all the time. Acts chapter 5 and verse 6 says this, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. The Bible's always tying faith and the Holy Spirit together. If we want to have more of the Holy Spirit, you get that by having more faith. Now what about those who say, well, my faith is pretty weak. I don't have much faith. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh. If you don't have much faith, listen to this. Well, then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We always come back to this, don't we, brothers and sisters? If you want more faith, get into God's word. There is no excuse. Get into God's word. Too often we are too busy choosing the things of the world and pushing aside the word of God. 
If we'll read and study the word of God, you'll have more faith. And with more faith, you'll have more of the Holy Spirit. With more of the Holy Spirit, you will produce more fruit. This is the word of the word of God. This is what God's word tells us and how to live a victorious Christian life. You can't go through life and spend well not spending any time or much time in God's word. We must open up our hearts, read and study the word of God on a daily basis. It'll make all the difference in your life, in your spiritual walk with the Lord. It'll bring to us joy, peace, and blessings. They all come through the Word of God. And now we need to say a few things about faith because faith involves certain things. Let us read Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And let us read verse 8. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that, of, and, and, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So faith is a gift. It is a gift of God, and God tells us, that if we spend time in his word, he will give us faith. Our faith will grow. It will become stronger and stronger. And now there's a few certain things we need to understand about faith. faith. First of all, faith has to do with your attitude. Your attitude. There's a lot of people who don't have much faith because they don't have the right attitude. Romans 6 verse 18 says, Being then made free from sin, ye become servants of righteousness. Ye become servants of righteousness. Faith will only operate in a surrendered attitude. You are not the boss. It's, you're a servant to God. We must give our hearts to the Lord and crucify the old man of sin. The Lord will not accept the old man of sin, the pride, the jealousy, egotism, the anger. The Lord will not accept that. That is the old man of sin and he needs to be crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what happens. Matthew 21, verse 44. And so, whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Until you fall on the rock, Jesus Christ, and been broken, it cannot work. There's a lot of people who come to the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't want to be broken. They don't want to crucify the old man of sin. Unless the old man of sin is broken, this is what's going to happen to them as we conclude this verse. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So if you don't fall on the rock and are broken, at the coming of the Lord, the rock will fall on you. Your attitude must be one of surrender. Now faith also affects the will. We have to make a decision. We need to make a decision. And this is, what, this is what I'm going to do. Just like the prodigal son when he is feeding the pigs, as we quote from Luke 15, 18, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. He made a clear decision and he says, I will we need to make a clear decision. I will. God is not going to take you contrary to your will. Worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ is a decision that we have to make ourselves. I will follow the Lord with all my heart. 
It is a decision you have to make. And when you make that decision, Jesus will gladly accept you. Now, faith also affects the affections. Romans chapter 10, 1 through to 3 reads, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. So Paul says that he'd like his people to be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So Paul says they have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. In verse 3, for they bring, for they bring ignorant of God's righteousness, or for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. We must clearly see that, and we actually touched it in our Sabbath school lesson, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. There's nothing good in us. Even our best motives are tainted. Sister White illuminates that to us. We need to understand that. Too often, pride rears its ugly head. Exactly what happened to Satan. We want to sit in the driver's seat and push the Lord over to the passenger's side. And eventually, out the door. And we are in a desperate need for the Lord to take control of our lives. When we understand that Jesus has done everything to accomplish our salvation, then our affections are very much tied up in Jesus Christ. We must understand that Jesus paid our debt. Jesus lived a perfect life for us. Jesus accomplished everything for our salvation, for eternal life. Until we know that, only then are we set free. And that is spiritual freedom. Amen. Our opening verse, uh, uh, yeah, verse was from John 8.32. And ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. And of course our closing Bible verse is from 14.6 of the Gospel of John. Jesus said unto him... I am the way. Jesus is saying, I am the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And brothers and sisters, life eternal is found only in Jesus Christ.